John, why do you say that comedy is both truth and pain? Comedy is truth and pain because in every human moment, if you are aware of it, you can detect an underlying truth and pain of that moment. A joke is something that looks at and explores the truth and pain and gives the audience an opportunity to think about it in a slightly different way. Here's a classic. A, a, a fellow is falling from a um, skyscraper and he gets down about the 33rd, 34th floor and some guy leans out the window and says, how's it going? And says, okay, so far. So the underlying truth and pain is here's a guy who's in peril. That's the truth. And the pain is there's nothing he can do about it. And his expression, there's okay so far, is an acknowledgement of the truth and pain, but indirectly. And if you look at any joke you can think of, you're gonna find that it is an indirect acknowledgement of truth and pain. By nature then, are funny people cruel? That's a great question. I like to say comedy is cruelty. A thing isn't funny to the person it's happening to, it's funny to the people watching. It's not necessary that you don't have to be cruel to make comedy, but there is an element of cruelty in jokes because the thing isn't funny to the person it's happening to. We derive our emotional sustenance from experiencing vicariously the conflict or predicament or peril of somebody else and being observing it, but far enough away from it that it's not us. That's what gives us the emotional bond that makes us engage and the emotional separation that makes us laugh. Further to that, if I may, when people are creating characters in a situation comedy or a comic film, for example, they often become caught up in, the, in the, the sense of, I'm hurting these characters. I don't want to hurt my characters. This is, a, in a sense, conflict avoidance. In the real life, walking around the world, a lot of us try to avoid conflict. I do. I don't like conflict. As a writer, I don't have to engage in it. I can just go home and write. But when I am guiding characters through story, my emotional need to protect them from conflict fights against the need of the story, which is to put them under pressure so they can advance toward a new understanding of themselves. Characters in stories, like people in the real world, will not undergo authentic change unless they're forced to. They'll stay in a status quo. All stories, in a sense, put pressure and increasingly more and more pressure on a character until the character is forced to enter an explosive new truth. The consequence of this is, in order to help our characters achieve their growth, we have to burden them with opposition, with conflict. So the thing that we're afraid of giving them, conflict, that's actually the thing they need. Can you explain how comedy begins with someone suffering? The classic comic book, comic, uh, moment we can think of is somebody slipping on a banana peel. If you're a five-year-old, you're laughing at that. Why are you laughing at that? Somebody slipped on a banana peel. They might have gotten hurt. But if you look at the person who slips on the banana peel, it's never an innocent person. It's always somebody who in some sense deserves it. Somebody who is the wrong attitude, arrogance, selfishness, uh, uh, impatience, uh, clumsiness. That's not exactly on target. But if a person with high status slips on a banana peel, then the person with high status is brought low. And the, the fall from high status to low status for people who have low status is always very funny. And for most people in audience situations, low status is kind of baked in. They're in the audience. They're not the performers. So if they see the high and mighty performers slip and fall or otherwise suffer, they get the first benefit of watching a funny thing happen to someone who's not them. The second benefit of seeing somebody, uh, some high and mighty person brought low. And then the third benefit of processing all of this more information more effectively because they have a new way to think about it and experience it. That guy was rushing. He slipped on a banana peel, fell on his butt. And I laughed, but I also learned a lesson, and the lesson is don't rush, and also don't be so high and mighty. So there's a lot packed into a joke that looks like it's about the suffering, but it's really about triggering the laugh reflex, which is a matter of giving the audience a puzzle to solve and then letting them solve it. What's going on here? How is slipping on a banana field 
appeal impacting the situation. What's the new result? Aha. Guy with status slipped on a banana peel. I'm laughing. So let's say if I'm at an office party, the office Christmas party, and my good friend comes from the bathroom, she has lipstick on her teeth, or forbid she has a, a pantyhose tucked in the back, I'm going to tell her. But if it's Marge from accounting, who I can't stand and who's, who's, who's messed with my check, I might, I might laugh at that. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a great example because a, a thing isn't pun funny to the person it's happening to, and that includes close allies. Like if it's happening to me, I feel it. If it's happening to people I care about, I feel it in a different way than if it's happening to people I don't care about or hate, through the example that, that you suggested. I'm going to help my friend because this isn't a laughing situation. I, I have no value. I get no value out of making fun of my friend, although some people do. But I do get value out of making fun of Marge from accounting, who is deserving what she's getting at this moment. I'm reminded of something that my wife and I passed through early in our relationship. Being a funny guy, I would make jokes about anything and everything. And some of those jokes were kind of at her expense. You know, like my wife, she doesn't know how she, she's, she, she's so dumb she couldn't pass a blood test, as an example, of a joke that doesn't do me or my relationship or my wife or our relationship any good at all. Over time, I learned that if I'm telling a joke at the expense of a loved one, I'm doing damage that I don't want to do and don't need to do. You can consider a stand-up comic having the challenge, how can I be on a stage and talk about my family in a way that's funny and in a way that gets the laughs and advances my career the way I suppose, the way I want it to, and speaks the truth that I want to speak without hurting the people around me? It's possible, but it's, it's a space that needs investigating. But on the flip side, we can, we can tear ourselves apart and, and it's actually funny. And, and in that, you find the solution to the problem. How do I make fun of my family without hurting my family? I make fun of myself. I don't say, my family is so stupid they do X, Y, or Z. I say, I'm so stupid I don't understand why my family does X, Y, or Z. And that gets you out of the trap. I can give you a great example of this, and it's one that, well, we can reference because it's in the public domain, uh, or in the public sphere, one would say. Years ago, I was in Russia running the Russian version of Married with Children, like you do. And I happened <laughs> to be there at the same time that Phil Romuno, the creator of Everybody Loves Raymond, was in Russia doing the pilot of Everybody Loves Raymond for Russian television and also doing a documentary of his own experience. Now, I was a fly on the wall and I saw how my Russian colleagues wanted to close off to him. They were afraid of him. They were afraid that his documentary would make fun of them, that the whole point of the exercise was to mock the quaint and idiotic ways of the Russian people. But Phil Romuno is much smarter than that. The whole comic perspective of the piece is, there are things going around here that I do not understand. And all the comic energy is directed on what Phil Romuno does not understand, not directed at the things he's observing and would otherwise be tempted to make direct fun of. And as a consequence, the documentary works for American audiences and Russian audiences because there's a, a generosity of spirit underneath the whole thing. It's the filmmaker's intention for everybody to have a good time. The Russians who are participating in the documentary, the audience watching at home, and he realizes his intention by focusing all the comic energy on himself, which is a 100% safe target all the time. As a coda to that story, if you happen to watch that video, watch very closely at the end. There's a rap party for the documentary and the pilot, and uh, I'm in the background, and you can see me for that long. Great. So. Before we leave Russia, if I may, yeah, okay. sort of ask and answer my own question. We're interested in the question of where do jokes come from? What are they made of? How do they work? And we've addressed one thing that's for sure. Comedy is truth and pain. Comedy is cruelty. But here's something else to look at, and it's called the feat of expectation. I'll tell you a joke, and then we'll deconstruct it a little bit. This joke comes to mind because it's about Russian vodka. Uh, I was in Russia, and I was given some Russian pepper vodka to try. Oh, pepper vodka, very hot. And I tasted it and they asked me, how was it? I said, well, it starts like Tabasco and finishes like paint thinner. 
<laughs> okay. Okay, so now the defeat of expectation is found in the phrase, and finishes like paint thinner. Because the way I have set the joke up, I'm describing the vodka as if I were an expert, like a wine expert. It starts, you know, it starts with notes of cherry and finishes with oak or something like that. You and the audience are already putting the pieces of the puzzle together. You're thinking, oh, he sounds like a wine connoisseur. He's identified a note in the vodka that I would expect to find in a pepper vodka. At this point, the audience doesn't really know where the joke is going. They can expect that it's not going to go to, it starts like Tabasco and finishes like Frank's Louisiana hot sauce, because there's no surprise there, there's nothing interesting there. But if I say, starts like Tabasco and finishes like paint thinner, I have created a, a picture in the mind of something that's ah, horrible and completely destroyed the picture in the mind of something that's being apprehended like a glass of fine wine. And that destruction of one image and its instantaneous replacement with another, that's a comic tool called defeat of expectation.